Grab a seat, please. Just mention a couple of things. So they're going to be a little bit different this morning. Um, uh, we call it our social Sunday, so we're going to let you know a little bit about some of the social projects we either do or are attached to, um, ways in which you can pray, give, serve, all those kinds of things. Um, but just to, to say a couple of things. First of all, um, that this week there's no connect groups. It's ladies and men's connects instead. So the ladies are meeting at Anne's house on Tuesday at 7.30, and the guys are meeting down on the beach um, on Thursday at 7.30, there will be shelter down there in the form of a wigwam <laughs> and a fire. And we're going to have a Bible study uh, and prayer and stuff down there. That's going to be at the Nest Beach down through the tunnel at 7.30. So come along, that would be great. Um, also, Christmas is fast approaching, as you probably see on the... Anyone playing Christmas music at the moment? Come on. Yeah, look at them. There's some out there. <laughs> Fast approaching, and um, you saw, hopefully saw an email that we sent out recently. We're trying to strip things back, so we've got three main things going on. We've got our kids' nativity, which Kat and her team are organising on the fifth outside powwow. Uh, that'll be uh, some donkeys and bales of hay, and the kids can dress up. So invite friends, come along, uh, be part of that, please. Uh, then on the twelfth, we've got our ma- our kind of main together church event, which is going to be in the Triangle, which is a Christmas fair, and there will be music. The Salvation Army will be there with their brass band. Um, there'll be various stalls and bits and pieces going on. Uh, so again, there'll be sign-up sheets coming around. Please sign up and get involved in that. The idea is that we connect with people, uh, tell them about Jesus, maybe even pray with them, and invite them along to the carol service as well. So uh, really good opportunity. Paul's going to be there doing this thing called In the Picture, which means that people can dress up, have their photo taken of a kind of a nativity scene uh, and take home with them. So Really looking forward to that. And then our carol service is on the 20th of December. The uh, theme for our carol service is Emmanuel. And we're asking the question, is God really with us? Um, so you'll see some advertising starting to come out soon about that. It's going to be very much stripped back. We're going to be looking at um, the, the story, the narration of, of, of Christmas and the, and the nativity. Um, but we believe it will be a powerful time where we really will see God with us. So please, please invite people along. Start inviting people now. Start um, bribing people to come along, whatever it takes. Just get them here. That would be great. Um, I just want to mention a couple of things. Dave and Tina are going to come and speak to us mainly, and they're going to share some stuff and work that they've been involved in, which hopefully will challenge and excite us as well. But I just want to mention a few of the things that we are involved with as a church. And if you give to the church, this is where some of your money goes towards. Uh, many of you are possibly actively involved in that as well. Um, first of all, we, we work with Compassion. And Compassion, we sponsor children out in India. And our youth and our children's work both uh, support children over there, uh, writing letters, sending phone funds through the church and I know many of you also have got uh, individuals that you look after and it's a great way in which uh, um, Jesus is shown in a practical way and what I love about compassion is they're very much overt about their faith they're not just about kind of providing uh, a physical need they also provide a spiritual need and they're introducing these children and, and parents into uh, not only providing them education and food and home and clothing but bringing them into church and into uh, kids clubs and things like that and it's a really important work that, that I really encourage you to be praying about and thinking about. We also work with CAP uh, and Chris runs our CAP centre. We had a uh, debt management uh, courses running as well. Um, Another way in which helping people that are stuck in poverty, uh, suffering from depression, not knowing what to do, how they can be introduced to the love of Jesus in a really practical way. And the team pray for these. They have profenders that come alongside them. And if you're interested in in that kind of work, please be praying for that, but also speak to Chris and maybe plug into it. Um, We also work with HITS and Anode in terms of doing food banks and food distribution. Um, One of the things we put in our email recently, if you know people that could do with, say, a a Christmas hamper or something like that over this time, please be speaking to us. And so we look at distributing food and goods to people uh, in need. Uh, Another way in which, again, the the money that you give to the church and the way that you practically serve helps people. Um, Obviously, we've got our Cafe Powwow, which is a a frontline place. Lots of people come in there. Um, Lots of people have opportunity to chat and talk things through and difficulties through and we've also helped people out quite a lot we've heard of needs that people have had and we 
have a what we call an in need fund as a church, which is money that we put aside for uh, people within the church, but also with outside the church that might be in need, whether it's buying carpets, whether it's painting, whether it's providing uh, shopping, all those kinds of things. And again, just another way uh, in which we as a church help and serve people. Um, and the reason why we're trying to share some of this stuff today is so one, that you know what is the available, so that if you can think of people or need people that are, or meet people that are in, in need, that we can um, help them in the best way that we possibly can. Um, just uh, another thing that we are looking at very uh, uh, very recently, and Peter Stevens isn't here, is the men's shed. So I'm going to try and remember what Peter told me, but, but um, men's shed is a new initiative that Peter's uh, getting up and running, which involves getting guys together and... Um, they find a shed or a garage or some kind of place where they can congregate um, and it could be that we bring to people bring tools there to um, to renovate they might do some various bits of woodwork or engineering and and there's two big ideas to it it's to try and get guys that feel isolated to connect. So it's a way of guys of connecting, but also it's a way of helping the community. So these guys then can go back and do DIY projects on people's homes. People can bring maybe bikes in or tools in that can get fixed. So it also has a way of, of helping with the, within the community. A few of the guys went to Brixham and Exeter recently and saw what they do. It's a, it's a national organization called the Men's Shed, and the people that are part of it are called Shedders and because uh, they live in sheds, I don't know. But, uh, but, it, but it's a phenomenal, if you get to hear it, speak to Peter about it, it's an amazing way of connecting people and helping the community. We're already affiliated to it. He already has a, an email, which I think is mens-shed at mars-heel.co.uk. Um, uh, we're looking for a shed or a, a lock-up or a garage or a building that's uh, empty and um, so that we can um, actually start working that. So again... Yeah, Timoth based is what we're looking for, hopefully, for that. Um, I'm just checking that I haven't forgotten anything else. We also do, um, um, Polly started something called Tree of Life, which is a way of distributing goods within the church as well. So you'll see that linked in our uh, newsletters. I want to play a quick video now because another charity in which we uh, work is Hope for Justice, which Karen does an amazing job at. And just a big plug to say they've got their clothes sale thing, whatever you call it. How do you, how do you call it? A clothes sale re-loved pre-loved pre-loved re-loved pre-loved clothes <laughs> at the baptist church in a couple of weeks time come along to that give money to it this is why because we're going to play a video now the the uh, the figure that kind of gets me every time is that they have found kids as young as one year old trafficked in this country i mean if that doesn't make you break inside and I don't know what will. And you know, we're a church that isn't just about words, but we're a church that is about action. You know, we, we hear many times, we hear it talked about that we are, to be, we are blessed by God so that we can bless this world. And we are sent on a mission to, to see the brokenness of this world restored. And we all can play a part in that, in the way that we give, in the way that we pray, in the way that we serve. And I want to encourage you this morning to be asking God, what is it that he's calling you to be and to do? Dame Tina, if you can come up, they're going to share a little bit. They work a lot within these areas. And Dame Tina are going to share a little bit about some of their experiences and some of the stuff that, that Tina's involved in at the moment. Um, hopefully to uh, bring a reality to this again a bit more. I'm going to pray for these guys. Thank you for Dave and Tina. Thank you for their heart and for their love for you. Father, thank you, God, that you continue to use them powerfully and mightily in the work that they're in. I pray now that you would just give them the words that you want them to say to us and that we will have receptive hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to speak a couple of minutes about what I do and then Tina will speak about the domestic violence work that she is so amazingly heading up. Um, we've both come an amazing long way from 1993, from when we got saved, to this point now where God is using us to be the part of solutions uh, for various broken people in this world. My job <coughs> is uh, prevention of homelessness in 
Teen Bridge. So it covers uh, Tynmouth and all the surrounding areas from uh, Newton Abbott to uh, Ashburton, out to here, Dawlish, Starcroft, okay? It covers quite an area. And I visit many very messed up people. I, I deal with people who have got nowhere to live and help them find places to live. And at the same time, I try to rescue people's homes when they're in dire straits. And I just want to give you two examples of cases that I am running at this moment in time, just to give you an example of how, how people can land up in these situations and, and what could happen. Now, we're going to give them fictitious names, one called Dave and one's called Simon. Okay. <laughs> Now Dave, he is a 63-year-old man. I am a 63-year-old Dave, so it's not me. Okay. He'd been living in a flat in this area for quite some time, and he's lonely, exceedingly lonely. He can't work through various illnesses that he has, and he allowed some other people to come and live with him, to, well, to stay with him, because they were homeless. And they did what something we call cuckooed happened. Does anybody know what a cuckoo does? A cuckoo lays its eggs in another uh, bird's nest, kicks everything else out and makes it its home. Okay. Now this is what cuckooing does with people. They move into somebody's house and they make it their own and almost kick the person out who's living there. It happens quite regularly. They're bullies, okay? And they usually work on the uh, principle that these are nice, gentle, soft people. And this David is a very gentle, soft, frightened person. Uh, they moved in on him. They emptied his bank account. They stole his television. They stole everything that could possibly be moved. And then eventually he moved out himself. And he just wouldn't go back to his flat. He, he presented at Teambridge District Council because he didn't know what to do. And then he was referred to me. And I took him back to his flat and we reported it to the police. These, these cuckoos left quite quickly. But by this time, his bank account had been emptied. He was in a thousand pounds of rent arrears and the landlord was knocking at his door to kick him out. Okay. And so I had to become then a, a liaison between him and his landlords who were really quite angry about what happened because these cuckoos had annoyed the whole of the flats okay, uh, by the noises that they were making, etc, etc. And they wanted him out. But I managed to liaise between them and say, look, could explain the situation. I said, please, can you give him some time? I said, we're going to try and work out on the finances of it all and see if we can get that sorted out. And, and we'll make sure that nobody else comes to visit this man that he doesn't want to be here. And they gave him a month's trial. I've since managed to get all his rent repaid for him. Okay. Uh, he is now, he shakes all the time when he talks. He talks, uh, stutter, he's so frightened, okay? But we've restored his home, okay? That's the kind of thing we do. Now, another person, which is Simon, okay? He's an ex Navy boy. He did 19 years in the Navy. And he was in the Falklands, and he saw and did some really, really horrific things. And he came out of there with PTSD. Um, which is yes and he never got it sort sorted it was quite a few years ago that he came out of the Navy and he never really got it sorted uh, he had a little bit of sort of psychiatric help but not a lot and then he was just left to his own devices his wife died everything left he left everything he lost his home he lost everything he became homeless and he's been homeless now for many years and then we found him one day as we're on the streets and he's there we took him into uh team district council which is always our first port of call and they took a duty of care for him because he has got local connections here and they put him into a bed and breakfast and in that bed and breakfast i went to see him and you know, I think I must have been one of the first kind people that he thought he'd meet and met. And I couldn't barely take any details for him for his tears. He was just shaking and crying with tears. He said, nobody's ever cared. Nobody's ever cared. Okay, I said, well, look, I care. All right, let's get down to brass tacks. Tell me your story. He told me his story, okay? And 
it was in this bed and breakfast and so I phone up SAFA which is the uh, services um, uh, it's, it's a body that helps ex-servicemen okay and they're in the process of going to come to him now I've used them before for various people they will find him a deposit for a flat they'll get him the furniture for a flat they will bring him combat stress okay which then he can get help with 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 all that and get all the psychiatric help they will also get him involved in his peer group uh, people and friends of people that he can get to mix with to help deal with his loneliness okay and he will begin to have a home and he will begin to again get the support that he's always needed now that's the kind of work that I do amongst all that there's a lot of scallywags and a lot of people that I deal with okay but I'm just picking out Dave and Simon right just to show you the sort of type of work that I do I love the work that I do and one of the things I'd love to do is this type of work, but totally involved under the umbrella of a church. Do you know that? I really would. But that's, that's the kind of work I do. And I'm going to hand you over now to Mrs. Cross, and she's got a great story to tell you about what she does. Thank you. Okay. Um, right, it's very tiny. Um, I don't know that we can make it any bigger. Um, Yes. Okay. What I'd like you to do, really, is just close your eyes for what a bit. Oh. What I'd like you to do is just close your eyes for a minute, please, everybody, and imagine. Imagine living with a bully all the time and being too scared to leave. Imagine being afraid to go to sleep at night and being afraid to wake up in the morning. Imagine being denied food, warmth, or sleep. Imagine being punched, slapped, hit, bitten, punched and kicked. Imagine being pushed, shoved, burnt, strangled, raped, beaten. Imagine having to watch everything you say or do in case it upsets the person you live with or else you will be punished. Imagine having to seek permission to go out, to see your friends or your family, or to give your children a treat. Imagine being a prisoner in your own home. Imagine being timed when you go out to the shops. Imagine that you believe what he tells you, that it's your fault, that if only you were a better mother, lover, housekeeper, kept your mouth shut, could only keep the children quiet, dressed how he liked you, to, kept in better shape, wasn't as fat, wasn't as thin, gave up your job, somehow things would get better. Imagine that you don't know where to get help, what to do or how to leave. Imagine that you can't face the shame of admitting what's really going on to family and friends. Imagine the threats if you dare to say you will leave. How could you ever find the strength to leave? Will you ever be safe again? Imagine threats to find and kill you and your children wherever you go. Imagine permanent injuries and sometimes death. That is the reality of domestic abuse. Okay, the definition of domestic abuse is defined by the Home Office as any incident of threatening behavior, violence or abuse between adults who are or have been in a relationship together or between family members regardless of gender or sexuality. Domestic abuse occurs across society regardless of age, race, gender, sexuality, wealth and geography. It may include physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, and financial abuse. Following a recent change implemented by the government, those aged 16 and 18 can now also be recognized as victims of domestic abuse, because they weren't. It, that's just a recent change. Police say domestic violence accounts for 27% of all recorded violent crime in Devon and Cornwall. There are an estimated 3,146 domestic violence incidents reported by the police in 2013-14, with more than 47% being repeat victims. 
for one year based on Torbay's population, the total cost of domestic abuse comes to £34 million. Pounds. Okay, I, I, I want to sort of give you... Um, Okay, I manage, all right, I manage the domestic abuse service for Torbay. Whatever form it takes, domestic abuse is rarely a one-off incident. It's normally a pattern of abusive behaviour that is used to intimidate, humiliate or frighten victims as a way of maintaining power and control of them. It's like a lot, with Pope of Justice, we have, we have, um, I can give you loads of statistics. Basically what I do is I run a refuge in Torbay. It's a seven bed refuge and we can take up to seven families and up to 17 children. At present we have um, three families and about six children. Uh, they come from all over the country because we, although you're supposed to have a local connection, Truthfully, if, you're going to, if you've had the courage to flee, then you need to get out of the place that you're in and come to another area. So even if somebody in Tynmouth would be allowed to come into Torbay to the refuge. And I just need to, hang on, wait a minute. So my service is called TDAS, Torbay Domestic Abuse Service. We have about 20 referrals per month and we have an outreach team that receives about 90 to 100 referrals a month. We operate um, a phone line, which is a, a helpline, so there's a number there that uh, people can ring up. You've got option one, which is for accommodation, and option two, which is uh, for help. Anybody can refer in. We take a lot of referrals from other agencies, um, child protection, schools, doctors, GPs, family, self-referrals. Um, in the UK, there is a call to the police for domestic abuse about one every minute. 30% of domestic abuse cases start or increase during pregnancy. 33% of children who witness domestic abuse will intervene to try and protect their mothers. And 71% of children who have a child protection plan live in households where domestic abuse occurs. Incidents of domestic abuse also rise at Christmas and sporting events. You know, people get angry and they, things don't work out the way they want. I just... Yeah. Signs of someone experiencing abuse or being an abuser. There's no way to tell for sure if someone is experienced domestic abuse. Victims are not always passive with low self-esteem and abusers are not always violent or hateful to their partners in front of others. There's lots of abuse. It's a control. Most people experience relationship abuse do not tell others what goes on at home. And domestic abuse isn't... It goes across all types of people, all types of situations. It cuts across all classes and families. Um, just... I manage a team of 13 staff. We have what's, um, they're called IDVAs, an Independent Domestic Violence Advisor, it's a, um, which we get trained by the police. We work very closely with the police, and we get trained by the police and by um, a company called Safe Lives, which uh, trains us in risk and um, in a lot in the law. We have to, we have to act within the law. Um, I have three IDVAs already. I'm just about to do my IDVA training starting in December, which is great. And we have a court IDVA, so if somebody is going to court or that's got the courage to actually make charges against somebody and is, is going in through a court case, they will be allocated a court IDVA, somebody that will stand up and help them through whatever it is that they're going through. Um, at the minute, in the refuge, we've got three families, and there's a, um, a lady there um, who we think uh, had been trafficked. Anyway, she's got three children, one of her little boys. The other, I just want to... I hadn't really thought about the impact upon children in a domestic abusive relationship, and there's this little boy, and he's nine, and uh, the other day I was over the refuge, and... Um, He's just, he knocked on the, the office door and he's sobbing his heart. He's like, I'm, I'm really sobbing. His mum um, had, had 
shouted at him and called him stupid and had like pushed his face and uh, you know that's not allowed that's you know it's not allowed anyway but I just this kid he said to me you know I was trying to explain that his mum is stressed and she's had to give up everything her husband has just got 49 weeks in prison uh, but he's due out in about six weeks and they've got four weeks to get back home to Plymouth get all their stuff and then they have to leave and go to another part of the country and this little kid, you know, I said she's stressed and she doesn't mean these things. And he just said, we're all stressed. He said, we're all struggling. You know, he says, I know why we're here. And I just, for the first time, was made aware how much of an impact this has on children. You know, we often think of the victims, but the children are the people who will, and they will reenact what they see, what's happening in their in their families. Social media is a, is, a, is, a, is a big problem as regarding domestic abuse. You know, you get people that watch all kinds of stuff on the internet, and although it can be good, you don't know, you get stalking, you get people that will um, bully people, that will offer them all kinds of different things, and it's just, you know, although the internet is good, we have to um, be careful because the victims of domestic abuse can be traced through the internet. You know, you can Google somebody, you can find out. The refuge is a secret address. We have, um, okay, we have five safe houses in the community. Uh, they're owned by Sanctuary Housing and we carry out all the housing maintenance and everything. We provide support, we provide CCTV camera um, and they can stay there for about eight to ten weeks and then we have to find somewhere else for them to live. It's about constantly moving them around so it's always secret addresses. We get... Um, on a, on a daily basis, we receive uh, referrals from the police that we have to contact within 48 hours because there's different levels of risk. So you get high risk, medium risk, and low risk. And we offer advice to people over the phone, um, give them an assessment if they want to come in and receive um, support or they just want a bit of advice or they need to move out or they need to make plans to move. And it, it's quite a long process to plan somebody to move out of an abusive relationship because um, there's statistics that show that there have been quite a few deaths when people have made that decision to actually leave. It's quite scary, because this is happening down the road. <laughs> this is happening all over the place. Um, yeah. Um, to stay in the, in the refuge costs £287 a week, which normally is covered by housing benefit, and the people that stay there have to pay... Um, a top up of 15 pounds. Often these people are lonely, um, frightened, um, have learned ways of coping and learning how to live with life. And I just feel that you know the church has the answer, Christ has the answer to all of these things. And it's just about I'd like people to just be aware, just just be aware of people that you know, you know, look out for things. Next week is uh, National Domestic Abuse Awareness Week, and we're aiming, it's being focused certainly in this area on younger children, because um, to know about what a right relationship is, you know, and I, I always get asked these questions, it's because we're a godless society, that's why things have gone so wrong. So um, I just believe that as a Christian, as, as somebody who's born again and has been loved by Christ, that we need to just look out for our neighbours, just look out for our, our neighbours and share the love of Christ, because we are the answer. You know, the church is the answer. We should be doing all of this stuff um, rather than leaving it up to people that don't have the answer. You know, we can, my company can help keep the problem there, but they don't have the answer. So, um, if somebody comes to you, listen to them. Take the person seriously and believe what they say. Be calm and positive. Um, give them time to discuss their feelings. And next week I'm going to bring some um, materials that have got phone numbers on and we've got things with like little barcodes that you can, if you think, you know, like when you give out the food at Christmas, you know, like on some of the tins, you can just stick a barcode on there. It's got a phone number on there. Um, 
Yes, the domestic violence number. So anybody would ring these numbers and then would be put in touch with the people that they need to be put in touch with. Um, don't put yourself in danger. Really watch what you're doing and get involved with people. <laughs> um, I just want to read you a quote from a 1960s Good Housekeeping magazine. Before your husband comes home... Oh, sorry. It's not just about women. You know, we've got, um, we've got I think, 60 male sufferers of domestic abuse, especially with different sorts of relationships that are happening now, and you have mixed relationships, and anybody is open to be abused. But this quote from Good House King, before your husband, wife comes home, brush your hair, put a ribbon in, tidy the home, have his tea ready and put on some lipstick, a smile and a clean penny. Don't bother him with your day. He has had a busy day and his day is more important than yours. Don't ask questions if he is late or stays out all night. But things have moved on from here, <laughs> um, which is great. Yeah, I mean, that's how it used to be. But the police, especially in Torbay, are very good. They have a, um, a specialised, dedicated domestic abuse team. And we, we work with them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I don't know what else to say apart from... Eh? Oh, yeah, if anybody... If anybody knows of anybody or has any concerns about anybody that is experiencing or has been a victim of domestic abuse, please come and see us afterwards and we'll either get somebody to pray with you and, and have a talk. Okay. Thanks, Tina. Give Tina a round of applause. Thank you for that. Again, just gives us a bit of a flavour right, of what's going on. Um, as I said, I want us to be a church that doesn't just kind of think these are good ideas, but that we are actively involved in these things. Um, we're already thinking and praying about different ways, as you've already heard, as what we're already linked in with as a church, but other ways in which we can expand this. And I just want to read something from the Bible that, will, that kind of puts this all together, and then we're going to go into a time of prayer and worship, and it says this, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, with the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer him, them, and tru saying, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on the left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into the eternal punishment by the righteous, by the righteous into eternal life. A really sobering words from Jesus about not just being what we talk about hearers, but doers of the word. So let's, I'm going to invite the band to come up. If we can just stand where we are. And I think it would just be great for us just to take a moment and pray into some of these things. Think about the way in which uh, we as a church are trying to connect with those that are on the edges of society, those that are struggling. Think about the work we do with compassion and with hope for justice, with empower and with hits and anode in the food distributions, with our in need fund for uh, those that might need new goods or work done on their house. Think about the stuff that we've heard about the homeless and those that are uh, being domestically abused. Think about the way in which um, we can cry out to God in prayer, but let's think about how he will then speak to us 
in the way that he maybe wants us to then do something about it. So as we pray, and may our prayers be two-way. May it be prayers in asking God to work through us, but also us listening to what he's talking to us about. Father God, we thank you that throughout your word that it reminds us of your character, of your goodness, of your love and of your provision. Father, we thank you that you are the one that fights for the weak, that brings healing to the broken, that raises up those that are downtrodden, that rescues those that are enslaved. Lord, I thank you, Lord God, that you are a practical God that works supernaturally in the everyday of our lives. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that we have as Christians to be able to share your love in these practical ways. And Lord, we ask that we may be stirred up. Lord, that we won't be so busy with our own pursuits and our own lives that we miss those around us that you've put in our place to love and to give and to pray and to serve. Lord, I, I ask that, that, Lord, that these things won't just fade away from our memories when we go and have our Sunday roast, but, Lord God, that we will even look for opportunities over the meal table to share your love with those around us. Lord, I pray that you'll show us as a church if there's more and other areas that we can serve and do, Lord God. But Lord, we ultimately know, as Tina said, Lord, that the answer is you, Jesus. Lord, we know that you are the answer to every situation and every problem, Lord God. And we ask that as we make ourselves available, that people will meet you, Jesus. And Lord God, that you will transform and change their lives, that you will turn them around. Lord, that you'll give them a hope. Lord, that you would give them a, a purpose and that you would give them a future. So, Lord, we just uh, thank you for what you're doing. And, Lord, we make ourselves available to you today, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.